Hi folks, Kevin here. Well, today I want to discuss zones as it applies to the permaculture design process. Zones are very important because they help us to determine where these areas of uh, contact will be on our site and how much time we'll spend there. And it really helps us to plan efficiency and effectiveness of each one of our zones. So in the picture above here, here is our house on the top of the screen. Here's zone 1A. It's outlined by a dog run that's fencing around here. You can't see it all because we have a large tree here, shade tree, and we have a, a pergola here. And, and inside of our zone 1A, inside of the dog run, is the keyhole garden, which I'll go over in a moment, and a small harbor freight greenhouse right here that's only 10 by 12. And in our zone 1B, which is a large area out here, I'll go over in two subsections of zone 1B, and I won't go over zone 1C, D, E, and, and so on. However, let's go ahead and get started and discuss these zones. Zones are pretty much uh, dependent, uh, we, we're descriptive in terms of the time in the areas of each zone. And there's typically, in, in, in most cases, there are, there are a total of six zones. Zone zero, one, two, three, four, and five. So they're defined by how frequently we visit the area, how long we stay in the area, and how we get to the area, where, how the property layout is actually set up. We also, with respect to zone, uh, what are the needs of the area? For example, zone zero and zone one have lots of uh, care required. There's lots of maintenance, a lot of time spent in, zo in zone zero and zone one. However, in zone five, it's almost autonomous, it works completely on its own. It's our wilderness zone. You know, how people move through the site is also very important. So every spot on every site has its own level of interaction. So the frequency of interaction, the time, uh, the length of, of, of interaction that we're going to have, the required maintenance within the, within the zone, and not every site has all zones. For example, if you live in a small apartment, your little balcony may be your main area that you're going to and taking care of all your plants all the time. Now, when we're talking about permaculture and zones, it doesn't have to be a garden and that sort of thing. It can be, a, it can be an office building. It can be related to a community uh, uh, center. So uh, permaculture can take in the design process of many different types of areas. So I mentioned before, well, let me say that zones can change over time. And as I mentioned before, we take a look at our zone one area inside of the dog run. So as you can see in, on this screen, here's part of the dog run fencing around the perimeters and it goes both ways. The greenhouse is right under our camera down here and I'm looking down at each one of these keyhole gardens. So the keyhole gardens, we can walk into, the, into these little indentations all around the places here and we can reach and harvest the, the crops that we want to get in there. This worked out very well in the, in the beginning, however, we've made some changes, uh, plans in the future. So although there was a great deal of work and effort put into designing and building this area, this zone is actually going to change in the future. Now, our zone 1B, I, I mentioned before that I was gonna look at two sections of zone 1B, and they're organized based on the, the amount of activity that's actually going, in there, going on in there, and it's ease of access, and where they're located. And as you remember, this is just outside the dog run. Here's zone 1B uh, as well, so the other section of it. So we've got permanent raised beds here, we've got hoop tunnels, we've got multiple rows here, and we're still not done with our zone 1, but this is our vegetable garden. It's visited every single day. We are whole food plant-based people, so we really rely on, on the materials that we get out of our gardens. So. The, this area, our zone one, needs lots of good sun. We need to get as much solar exposure as possible to this area. We need to have a good slope in, the, in a cold uh, northern temperate climate because we get a fair amount of rain typically. So we, need to, we can't let our, our beds get completely soaked. Now back to zone zero. 
This is a photograph of today I took. This is February 19th, uh, 2017. And you can see that the large maple tree just south of the house, so we're looking at the south face, you can see the sun hitting, hitting the side of the house. On the right of the screen is our little Harbor Freight greenhouse, a 10 by 12 greenhouse. This is a two-story salt, bo salt box construction post and beam uh, house. Most of the windows are on the south face, including double sets of French doors. So we get lots of solar gain during the summertime. We have a two foot overhang all the way around the house. And what this two foot overhang allows us to do during the winter solstice, the sun is all the way at the top of the windows. However, by uh, the, the uh, summer solstice, the sun will be way down here. So we get lots of shading in here, plus the shading of, of the tree itself. So we get uh, energy efficiency by the design of the house being passive solar, no solar panels on this because this tree is going to put shade onto this roof. And we're going to have plenty of summer cooling because of the, the, the way that the site is set up as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So zone zero, it's the home. It's the center of activity. It's the place where we rest and recover. We want to encourage energy efficient design, if at all possible. We want to have an environmentally appropriate for the climate in sight. So if we're in a southern zone where, it's, where we have to deal with hot, dry winds, we want to incorporate a lot more uh, shade and that solar gain would not be something we'd be looking for in our house design. So inside of our zone zero house, we're growing our own microgreens because we're in a cold northern uh, temperate climate and we're not, we don't have the season extension uh, available to us right now. So right here we have broccoli microgreens growing and so we harvest those every two days and that provides lots of uh, nutrients for us, phytonutrients that are so important because these microgreens have over a nearly a hundred times as much uh, uh, phytonutrients, sulforaphane, uh, as it, broccoli crowns. So we get lots of super nutrients and we incorporate those in our diet every single day. Now zone one. Zone one is that kitchen garden area that we typically think about. And again, I'm describing what's going on in a typical homestead, farmstead, uh, place, but this could be for a business as well. And you may, and your zone one is really just talking about you're, you're spending a lot of time in that area. So herbs and vegetable gardens are typically in there. It's got to be easily accessible. You don't want any challenges getting to your zone one gardens. You can have small fruit trees and berry bushes. And as I mentioned that th around the perimeter of the dog run are all blueberry bushes in that area. It can have greenhouses and cold frames and propagation areas in your zone one. Vermicomposting, which is a red wiggler, uh, composting worms where you take your kitchen waste and put that into the area and create really nutrient source and you're, you're decreasing the chances of waste actually leaving your property. It's a place where you can store your firewood for your wood burning devices or fuel that you have on site to, for heating and, or cooling your, your home. Uh, pet enclosures, like we have the dog run there. Uh, some people will have their chicken coop just outside uh, of their house as well in the zone one area. Now zone two, this is our chicken coop. This is attached to the work area. Uh, and the work area is where the greenhouse is going to be going up next to. So there's some chickens right here, some ducks over here. This is the south face here. We're looking at the west face here. Here's a chicken door, duck door right here with a little ramp going up. So this has worked out extremely well for our zone two area. Now, it's a place where we can have our home orchard and we can have diverse species of fruit and nut trees in, in here. Again, zone two is just downscaling the amount of time and energy that we spend uh, uh, you know, as opposed to our zone one or more intensely zone zero. So we're, we're spending a little bit less time. Chicken coop, you're going to visit oh, probably two times a day or three times. Uh, so it really depends on, on what you're doing, how your system is set up. So this is, is, is fairly typical of the zone two setup. 
around your orchard plants and all, you may have some other plants, some nitrogen fixers, some gilds. You're going to try and plant plants that suppress the grasses and that also benefit the, uh, the fruit production and nut production on your site. Between the rows of these trees, you could have uh, some of the uh, mobile or permanent fencing in between to graze various animals. Now our chickens and ducks, they go through our food forest areas where our, our, our orchards are as well. We can have interplanting of crops uh, uh, amongst the trees so you can get vegetables there while it takes a few years for those uh, trees to produce their, their berries and their nuts for you or the, or the bushes, the blueberry bushes or raspberry bushes, whatever perennial bushes, but not your herbs in zone two. Your herbs for the, uh, your culinary herbs, uh, excuse me, the culinary herbs, the ones that you want for your kitchen garden, you either want to have them in zone zero inside your home or just outside in zone one. And typically it's zone one. Your fruit trees, orchards, uh, orchards as I had mentioned, your standard composting can go up in this area uh, as well. So we do quite a bit of composting to make the soil for our beds. Our beehives are out in this area amongst the food forest area around the orchard. Ponds are, are located in this area as well. Your chicken and duck housing as I showed in the image above. And you can have some large animal housing and enclosures as well. Uh, so there's a whole variety of things you can do in zone two. When we get into zone three, we're talking about even less frequently visited areas. So zone three might be your, your market garden. It might be your cash crops that you're going to sell. Uh, it, it can be pastures for large animals. Now, in this picture, you see my wife, Thea, and she's harvesting red raspberries. So our goal is to uh, plant more of these um, perennial berry bushes, and we have several different types right now. So we have a, a thornless blackberry area, raspberry area, strawberry area, and current area, as well as a couple other berry areas that we're hoping to have pick your own. Uh, so that, that'll be similar to a, a cash crop that we can set up in our zone three area. And actually that area that's gonna be uh, the most common place is closer to the road frontage. Now our zone four area. Again, uh, we're not as frequently visiting, visiting this area. This is actually some of the maple uh, forest near our sugar shack. So this is an area where we'll be only going uh, rather infrequently to do whatever pruning and work that needs to be done to clean up the area and to do our tapping of the trees during the early spring uh, time. So it's a mixed trees and shrubs. They provide habitat, wood, privacy, and shade. These are partly wild and minimally managed areas. And again, this is zone four. It's, it's used for harvesting from the wild, your medicinal plants, your mushrooms, your timber, your lumber as well. So that's your zone four. When we get into zone five, sorry I don't have a photo for this one because it all looks the same as our zone four right now. That's really our wilderness area. That's a place we're really not visiting very often. Now we happen to have tra trails that go through our zone five area, but we try to leave the habit habitat undisturbed for all the wildlife that are there all the time. It's not managed, other than the occasional work that we may have to do coming in and picking up some of the trees that have, that have uh, fallen over and done limb damage to other trees. So it's a natural ecosystem. So here we are, we've gone over the zones. It's all about planning the, efficiency, the efficient design, the layout of your property based on how much time you're spending in each area, how frequently you're visiting, and how, how long those periods are. And we want to set these zones up as if at all possible so there's uh, little, little obstacles in our paths. And as we make our way through our zone one garden and going over to the coop area, we can grab produce along the way and feed it to the chickens. Having good access, you can see some of the roadways going around here, and it's much more extensive if I were to pull back on the drone footage. Um, but that, I hope, gives you a good idea of how the zone planning actually goes. So if you like this, please give us a thumbs up, uh, leave a comment, let us know what sort of things you'd like to see in the future. I'm trying to knock off as many of these uh, basic 
uh, permaculture topics as possible during these, this next month before I really get going full, full tilt with, with all the uh, starting the seedlings and all. So thanks very much, folks. If you have any questions or concerns, please let me know in the comments. Give us a thumbs up. So subscribe if you haven't. And please just pass this on and share it with your friends. Thanks so much and have a great day, folks. Bye-bye now.